Justine Waters glanced at her buzzing phone and saw a message from her husband, Tom, who had been away on business. She unlocked the device and read the brief note. Finished here. On my way back. Dinner reservations at Mario's for 7 p.m. Happy anniversary, Tom's message read, lacking any affectionate sign-off. Justine wasn't surprised. Tom hadn't been very communicative lately. Justine replied, see you. Happy anniversary. Love you, though she didn't anticipate a response. Setting her phone aside, she hoped for some acknowledgement from Tom, even a simple acknowledgement. Glancing at the clock, she realized she had enough time for a quick shower before meeting Tom. Sighing, she left the bed and headed to the bathroom to freshen up. Who was that? asked Jake Carter, the man she had just been with. Just my husband, Justine replied. He's on his way back and has made dinner reservations for our fifth anniversary at Mario's tonight. Your fifth anniversary, huh? Jake commented. I thought he was still back east. He was, Justine confirmed. But it seems he wrapped things up early. I'll need to call my mother to watch little Jacob for a while longer. All right, then come back to bed, Jake suggested with a grin. Maybe we can give Tom a little surprise. Justine chuckled, I'd love to, Jake, but I need to freshen up quickly. Luckily, I have some clean clothes here to change into before meeting my husband. I wouldn't want to show up in the clothes I wore over here. They're all wrinkled and stained. Do you think he suspects anything? Jake inquired. Justine shook her head. No, I don't think so, she replied. He's been preoccupied with something lately, hardly speaking to me or spending time with the baby. It's like he's in a different world. How long will you keep this up? Jake questioned. Justine shrugged. It's hard to say, she admitted. Tom is a good provider, and I know he'd be a great father if he made the effort. Do you think he knows Jacob isn't his? Jake asked. Justine frowned. If he does, he hasn't said anything, she answered. I can't imagine he would ignore something like that. Well, I'm here for you if you need anything, Jake assured her. Justine smiled, eyeing his flaccid penis. Just keep that warm for me, okay? She teased. You got it, baby, Jake replied, returning her smile. Justine retrieved a clean dress from the closet, reflecting on how much of her wardrobe was kept here instead of at home with Tom. Justine examined the dress she had chosen, trying to recall if Tom had seen it before. It was a blue dress, falling just above her knees and revealing a hint of cleavage. She was fairly certain Tom had seen it, but if not, she could easily claim she had recently purchased it. After calling her mother to arrange childcare, Justine headed to the bathroom for a hot shower, hoping to cleanse herself of Jake's semen before meeting Tom. She had made a vow to herself when she began her affair with Jake 16 months ago that she would never disrespect her husband by bringing his presence into their intimacy. She refused to engage in such behavior, especially now that they had a child together. Although Jake initially understood her stance, he began pressuring her to involve Tom in cleaning her out, particularly since the birth of little Jacob three months ago. Justine firmly rejected the idea, considering it disrespectful to her husband. After her shower, Justine styled her long dark hair, dressed, and applied her makeup. Satisfied with her appearance and scent, she kissed Jake goodbye and left for a meeting with Tom. Meanwhile, Tom sat in his Escalade in the parking lot across from Mario's, taking a drag from his cigarette. He had just received a message from one of his private investigators, confirming Justine's departure from Jake Carter's luxury condo. He observed the photo sent by the P.I., noting Justine's attire in the blue dress. Tom realized it was a different dress than the one she wore earlier that day, and one he had never seen before. He wasn't surprised. Justine had been correct about Tom's recent whereabouts. He had returned from the East a day ago after being informed of a serious security breach that required his immediate attention. If he didn't address it discreetly, he was warned that external intervention would occur, likely involving a covert federal agency known only to a select few. Recalling his tense meeting with the enigmatic figure referred to as Alpha One, Tom understood the gravity of the situation. He was instructed to resolve the issue quietly or face the consequences from forces beyond his control. 
Indeed, Tom replied, knowing well that yes, sir was the only response Alpha One expected. He understood the consequences of displeasing Alpha One, who was notorious for his ruthless methods, including making people vanish without a trace. The mere thought sent a chill down Tom's spine. To the outside world, Justine perceived Tom as a traveling salesman, peddling security systems to various companies seeking upgrades. However, Tom's role extended far beyond mere salesmanship. While he did indeed sell and oversee the installation of security equipment, the systems he provided were embedded with specialized circuitry, granting Alpha One unprecedented surveillance capabilities over the companies utilizing them. Tom was acutely aware that the breach Alpha One referred to was none other than his wife of five years, Justine. It marked their fifth anniversary today, although for the past year and a half, Justine had been engrossed in a passionate affair with Jake Carter, a senior partner at the law firm where she worked as a paralegal. Tom had only recently uncovered the specifics of the affair, largely due to his frequent business travels. Nonetheless, he had sensed the growing discord in their relationship for some time. When Justine revealed her pregnancy, Tom was advised by his lawyer that divorcing her while she was pregnant would be legally complex and financially burdensome, given the potential obligations of child support and maintenance. Suppressing his emotions, Tom endured Justine's pregnancy, grappling with his internal turmoil, exacerbated when she named the child Jacob after her illicit lover. Following the birth, Tom promptly requested a DNA test, confirming his suspicions that Jacob was not biologically his. Glancing at his watch, Tom anticipated Justine's imminent arrival. Spotting a couple matching the description provided by his contact, he proceeded to the restaurant entrance. After exchanging brief words with the hostess, Tom settled into a secluded booth, acknowledging the presence of the couple nearby. As Justine joined him at the table, Tom greeted her with a composed demeanor. Engaging in polite conversation, they ordered their meals while the distant strains of music hinted at the venue's additional amenities. Justine's mention of their song prompted Tom to consider indulging in a dance, acknowledging the significance of the occasion despite its underlying complexities. Would you care to dance? Tom inquired, rising from his seat. I'd love to, Justine replied, extending her hand. Tom accepted her hand and led her onto the dance floor. As they swayed in each other's embrace, Justine couldn't shake the feeling that Tom was keeping a distance between them, as though he couldn't bear touching her. When the song ended, Tom escorted her back to their booth, where their meals awaited them. Is everything all right, Tom? Justine asked, noticing his distant demeanor. You seem rather reserved, especially considering it's our anniversary. You're right, it is, Tom acknowledged. The truth is, your dress carries a scent reminiscent of Jake Carter's closet. Despite your efforts, you couldn't entirely rid yourself of his presence. What? Justine exclaimed, offended by Tom's accusation. Jake Carter? Are you serious? She retorted, attempting to deflect Tom's words. Indeed, Jake Carter, a senior partner at your law firm, Tom affirmed calmly. Of course I know him, Justine responded sarcastically. I certainly hope so, Tom remarked dryly. Considering the considerable time you've spent in his company, including sharing his bed and conceiving little Jacob. What are you insinuating? That's preposterous. I refuse to sit here and tolerate such accusations, Justine protested indignantly. You'll sit and listen, Tom asserted, opening his briefcase. You'll endure whatever I choose to disclose, especially in light of the past 16 months. What? Justine questioned, feigning ignorance. You know precisely what I'm referring to, Tom asserted. Let's begin with this, he continued, placing a document before her. What's this? Justine inquired. This is the result of a DNA test conducted on our child, Tom revealed. According to this, Jacob is not my biological son. The subsequent document confirms that Jake Carter is his father, the man you named Jacob after. How did you obtain Jake's DNA? Justine asked, bewildered. That was simple, Tom replied. You've been bringing it home with you at least three nights a week. But there's more. Retrieving a thick folder, he dropped it onto the table. And this? Justine inquired. 
A compilation of every communication exchanged between you and Jake over the past 16 months, Tom disclosed. Regrettably, privacy online is a thing of the past. All right, I admit it, Justine confessed. Jake and I had a brief affair, but it meant nothing. It was purely physical. Is that so? Tom questioned. I suggest you turn to page 75 and locate the passage I've highlighted. Read it aloud. Please, don't make me, Justine pleaded. You'll do it, or I will, Tom insisted. And I won't be concerned about who hears. Tears streaming down her face, Justine reluctantly turned to the indicated page and began reading the highlighted passage aloud. I can't believe you're speaking to me like this, Justine murmured. Do you think that's all I have? Tom retorted. I have photos, audio recordings, and hours of video evidence. You must really despise me, Justine whispered as she toyed with her food. Yes, I do, Tom admitted bluntly, shocking her. I used to be willing to do anything for you. Now, I can barely stand the sight of you. How long have you known, she inquired. I had my suspicions even before your pregnancy announcement, Tom revealed. I gathered evidence to satisfy the prenuptial agreement. By the time I consulted a lawyer, you had informed me of your pregnancy. The lawyer explained that no judge would entertain a divorce until after the child's birth, citing child support obligations. Now that Jacob is born, I have ample evidence to proceed, Tom continued, gesturing to the nearby table where two individuals stood and approached theirs. This gentleman has something for you. Ms. Justine Waters, the man addressed her. Yes, Justine responded softly as he handed her a manila envelope. You've been served, the man declared. Served? Justine repeated, tears streaming down her face. Yes, with divorce papers, Tom clarified, offering her a pen. Review them. They align with the prenuptial agreement. Sign them, and I'll provide you with a bank draft for the exact amount you had when we married. No more. I'm aware of your secret fund, which you may keep, along with your retirement savings. Your belongings have been relocated to your mother's house, Tom continued. She's aware of the situation and agreed to accommodate you temporarily for Jacob's sake. But, I don't want a divorce, Justine protested. I still love you. Please, Justine, Tom responded firmly. Let's not pretend. Listen. He played her conversation with Jake, causing her eyes to widen in shock. How did you obtain that? she demanded. I'll spare you the details, Tom replied with a cold smile. But I've had enough. Your free ride ends here. As for Jake, he's facing consequences too. I've spoken to your managing partner and made him aware of the situation with evidence. Mr. Carter's tenure at the firm is uncertain at best. He also agreed that it wouldn't be fair to penalize you, especially considering you're a mother with a newborn baby. After all, Mr. Carter held a position of authority over you, in a sense, and he didn't want to expose the firm to a potential sexual harassment lawsuit. Taking your tenure into account, he decided it would be best to retain your employment, at least for now, Tom explained. But rest assured, Mr. Carter's problems are only just starting, Tom continued. How much do you really know about your lover? I mean, truly know? What do you mean? Justine inquired. I'm referring to his clientele, the individuals he conducts business with, who he truly represents and what he's involved in when he's not with you, Tom elaborated. Do you have any insight into that? I'm not sure, she admitted. He doesn't discuss those matters with me. That's probably for the best, Tom remarked. Let's just say your Jake Carter has a rather intriguing clientele, the kind that attracts the attention of certain federal agencies. Agencies capable of making individuals vanish without a trace. Do you grasp the gravity of what I'm saying? You're frightening me, Tom, Justine confessed. And you should be frightened, he affirmed. Frightened enough to steer clear of Jake Carter. Because he's headed for trouble. And if you're in his vicinity when it happens, you'll be dragged down too. Who are you, really, Tom, she questioned. He smiled, indicating the paperwork in front of her. 
Sign the papers, Justine, and put an end to this charade. I may have already disclosed too much, Tom urged. And incidentally, I've canceled your credit card and changed the locks on the house today while you were with Jake. I've also addressed the bank account, so you no longer have access to it. Given your habit of stashing away half your earnings in your secret account, I don't foresee that being an issue for you. You've been quite busy, haven't you? She remarked. Tom shrugged. Defeated, Justine reviewed the divorce papers, finding them consistent with Tom's description. She signed the papers and handed the pen back to Tom. He smiled as he inspected the papers. The process server witnessed the signatures and the accompanying woman notarized the paperwork. Tom handed the papers back to the process server. I'll ensure these reach your lawyer, Mr. Waters, the server stated. Thank you, Tom acknowledged. After their departure, Tom turned back to Justine. I believe you need to surrender your rings, he instructed. Do I have to? I cherish those rings, she protested. Apparently not enough to refrain from Jake Carter's bed, Tom remarked. Tearfully, Justine removed her wedding and engagement rings, placing them on the table. He pocketed them before addressing her. I believe our business here is concluded. Concluded? Justine repeated. Is that all you have to say? What more needs to be said? Tom questioned. Why? Why did you choose our anniversary for this? She pleaded, tears streaming down her face. Do you realize how humiliating this is for me? Do you realize how humiliating it was for me to discover that you were having an affair all this time? And how humiliating it was to learn that Jacob isn't even my son? And how humiliating it was to discover that you were with Carter on our anniversary? Spare me, Tom retorted. We're over. We're done. Goodbye, Justine. I don't ever want to see you again. With that, he returned his attention to his meal, ignoring Justine, who wiped her tears. The waitress approached and inquired if everything was all right. Yes, the meal is excellent, as always, Tom remarked casually. I'll take care of the check, and I believe the lady will take her food to go, please. Uh, yes, sir, the waitress replied, hurrying to fetch a box for Justine's meal. She returned shortly and packed the remaining food in a styrofoam container. Tom handed his credit card to the waitress and settled the bill while Justine gathered her belongings. Once the transaction was completed, Justine turned to Tom. And that's it, she inquired. That's it, Tom confirmed with a wave of his hand. She couldn't believe how easily he dismissed her. I'm sorry, Tom, she apologized. He glanced up from his meal before responding. Well, on that we can both agree, he remarked. Good day, now. Give my regards to your mother. Oh, and happy anniversary, he added with a faint smile. Justine, shocked by her husband's calm demeanor as he essentially ushered her out like unwanted baggage, fled from the table, tears streaming down her face. Tom smiled faintly, then resumed his meal. He noticed a few patrons looking at him disapprovingly, but he simply smiled back, shrugging his shoulders. Though outwardly composed, he was torn apart emotionally. Five years down the drain. At least, the worst was behind him now. Epilogue, Tom managed to navigate the next few days without any major incidents. It wasn't easy. He had once loved Justine, and it pained him to handle the situation as he did but he reasoned it was preferable to losing control and reacting impulsively. Then came the day when he heard banging on his front door. He was upstairs in the master bedroom and peered out the window to see Carter's sports car in the driveway. Anticipating something like this, he had made some arrangements to his house as per Alpha One's advice. He descended the stairs and opened the door, finding Jake Carter on the other side, visibly furious. Tom backed up as Carter barged in. You son of a bitch. You cost me my job. And Justine won't even talk to me. I'm going to fucking kill you, you motherfucking piece of shit, Jake yelled, his face flushed with anger. He advanced toward Tom until he noticed 15 tiny red dots suddenly appearing on Tom's shirt. Intruder alert, an electronic voice blared from speakers embedded in the walls. Do not move. What the hell is this? 
Jake shouted, attempting to brush away the dots with his hands. Suddenly, there was a rapid-firing sound, resembling an air rifle. Jake looked down to see fifteen darts protruding from his body. He tried to reach for them, but collapsed before he could. I don't think you're going to be killing anyone today, Carter, Tom said calmly as he reached for his phone. He tapped on an icon and heard a man's voice. Operator 715463, the voice on the other end said. Clean up on aisle 15, Tom called out. Clean up on aisle 15. Copy that, the man acknowledged. Tom tapped another icon, causing the systems that had just shot Jake full of tranquilizer darts to rotate and retract into the ceiling seamlessly. Once the doors closed on the systems, there was no visible trace of their presence. Tom smiled, satisfied that the new security system functioned as intended. A few minutes later, a plain white van arrived in the driveway. Men dressed in Tyvek suits entered the house and removed Jake's unconscious body. One of them took Jake's keys and drove away in his sports car. Within moments, both the van and the sports car disappeared from sight. Tom closed the door and resumed his activities. A few days later, while Tom was buying a caramel mocha at a local coffee shop, he was approached on the street by a burly man in a dark suit and sunglasses. Alpha One wants to see you, Mr. Waters, the man said sternly. Immediately. All right, Tom responded, slightly taken aback by the man's demeanor. He followed the man to a long black limousine parked nearby and entered through the open back door. Waters, good to see you're up and about, Alpha One greeted as the door closed. Yes, sir, I have a lot on my plate, Tom replied. Alpha One smiled and placed a friendly hand on Tom's shoulder. Relax, Tom. Call me Regis when we're alone, the one-eyed man said. I wanted to give you an update on Mr. Carter. He's been cooperative. Thank you, Alpha, uh, Regis. So, he's provided the information you needed? Tom inquired. Oh, he spilled everything right away, Regis confirmed. But currently, he's singing like a bird. The tranquilizer darts and the serum we use to extract information have left him mentally compromised. He's currently in a cage, chirping away. Oh, Tom responded. Regis handed him an envelope from his jacket pocket. We managed to settle with him out of court before he became too incapacitated, Regis explained. He was so grateful to be alive that he agreed to a generous settlement. That's good to know, Tom acknowledged. By the way, I must say, I'm impressed with your new security system, Regis remarked. I'm glad you didn't opt for the .50 caliber chain guns I initially suggested. I share that sentiment, Tom replied. Cleaning up after that would have been quite the ordeal. Regis chuckled at the remark. Any news about Justine? Tom inquired. Yes, she's back at work, under close supervision from Mr. Parker, Regis informed him. Did you ever reveal your true employer to her? No, Regis, I never did, Tom confirmed. Regis nodded in understanding, already aware from his surveillance equipment, but wanting confirmation from Tom. Good, Regis said. Once your divorce is finalized, I'd like you to visit headquarters. I have someone I'd like you to meet. Someone? Tom questioned. I've always worked alone. Well, there's a first time for everything, isn't there, Tom? Regis replied. Yes, sir, I suppose there is, Tom agreed. That's the spirit, Tom, Regis said. I look forward to our meeting. As do I, Regis, Tom said. The door opened, signaling the end of the conversation. Tom exited the limousine and watched as the large man settled into the driver's seat. As the limousine merged into traffic, Tom pondered what Regis had planned for him. Fade to black. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Write your opinion in the comments.